Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Free Thinking Podcast. My name is Scott Olson here with Dr. Tim Stratton. Um, this week, we are surprisingly talking about free will again um, as we continue discussing the free will show. I know, Tim, I know you you hate talking about it. I keep dragging you into it. but <laughs> I'm looking forward to talking about some other things someday, but people keep pulling me back into this conversation. I'm trying to leave, but it seems like I don't have an ability to do otherwise. So hey, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So where we left off, um, we we're about ready to talk about uh, the next part of the podcast where, um, Matt says something, uh, about, um, kind of source hood and that, that whole thing. So Matt says, uh, yeah, Dirk Paraboom that who we interviewed talks about this, that there's a yeah. source hood condition on free will and manipulation arguments show that determined, or at least he thinks that or even people who think that his argument is successful think that manipulation arguments show that when the determinism um, rules out you being the proper source of your action because it's sufficiently like manipulation. Right. Yeah, so he himself is a source incompatibilist because he still thinks we don't have free will. But there are source libertarians. Um, Eleanor Stump is a big name that comes to mind. Yeah. One of the confusing parts is Kevin Tempe's got a really nice book on this, and he makes a distinction between wide and narrow or broad and narrow source incompatibilists. And mm -hmm. <clears throat> I forget which one's which. Maybe you can help me. Um, I think that the broad source incompatibilists include alternative possibilities in their requirements. Is that right? I think that's right. It's been so, a while since I've looked at that, but yeah. Yeah, so you have a view that, that requires being the proper source and having alternative possibilities. And then you have a narrower view that only requires being the proper source. And alternative right. possibilities is just like evidence that determinism is not true or something like that. Right. Yeah. And again, I would, I would affirm that broad view and I argue for the broad view. But all I need is the narrow view. If the narrow view is, uh, you know, if the narrow view passes... That's all I need to make my case. Hmm. Yeah. So they move on to their next question. Uh, can you elaborate on the distinction between luck and chance in the context of your project? Yeah. Another good question. So mm -hmm. I, I just want to repeat what Al Mealy said about it in our episode with him when this is one other one of those things where we have to, you know, define our terms. And I like the definition of luck as, uh, something that involves chance. So it's a, something that's chancy, mm -hmm. but it's also significant to the person. Um, so there might be some chancy things that aren't really lucky because they don't matter. Like maybe it's a matter of chance, how many blades of grass are in my lawn, but that doesn't matter. Um, right. But something that is significant, like whether I win a million dollars in the lottery would be more yeah. lucky because it's a matter of chance and it's significant. Yeah, I I completely agree with Matt's definition of luck, uh, but I don't think it's a problem for the Christian libertarian. Now, it might be for the libertarian who is also a naturalist. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, like Evan Fales, for example. Now, uh, I, I make a, a conditional move that's similar to those who advance uh, – externalism from a Christian perspective. Uh, here's what I, here's what I said in a recent article I wrote, uh, called God is not a deity of deception. Let me get this here. I said, I think we are warranted in trusting our own ability to reason, especially when we are being careful on matters like these. This is the case because if Christianity is true and we have good reason to believe it is true, then God seems to have created humanity with the supernatural ability to take thoughts captive, 2 Corinthians 10, 5 and Colossians 2, 8, uh, to think logically and to use reason, Isaiah 1, 18. Right? The, uh, this grace is what separates humanity from the animal kingdom, uh, end quote. So with that said, many times people think, that it's only libertarians who have the so-called problem of luck. But I think the, the bigger problem, uh, the, the bigger problem of luck is on the shoulders of the uh, determinists, especially of the 
uh, the ed advocates, either exhaustive determinism or exhaustive divine determinism. So consider something else that I said in a recent blog ar article. Uh, I said, on the Calvinistic view, God does not choose the elect based upon anything about the individual, lest any man should boast. So those who are passed by, right, the damned, and those who are elect seem to be based upon luck or chance. Indeed, the elect seem to have won a cosmic and infinite lottery of sorts. Moreover, those who have been created for the sole purpose of eternal damnation are literally the most unlucky folks in all of creation. So if one implies that Molinism has problems that Calvinism does not, this deterministic view of salvation does not escape the problem of luck, or so it seems to me. Uh, the libertarian who affirms the powers of reflective self-control argues that we have the power and opportunity to exercise an ability to take uh, what I call popping thoughts captive, 2 Corinthians 10.5, or not, Colossians 2.8. I believe this is a supernatural ability given to us by God in his grace. Uh, so my dog does not possess these abilities, right? So this is what distinguishes us from mere passive cogs at the mercy of external forces and makes it possible to genuinely be rational and responsible free thinkers. So with that said, this, uh, the same seems to apply on naturalistic determinism. If it's the laws and events of nature that causally determine all human thoughts and beliefs, then it's not the human who is causally determined to be right on a particular topic, more lucky than the poor guy who is causally determined to happily affirm a false belief. I mean, especially if physics and chemistry is just fizzing and popping. The person who thinks correctly seems to be more lucky than the guy who isn't. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I don't think uh, saying it's you libertarians who have the problem of luck. No, I think the problem is much worse if you affirm determinism. And for the Christian who affirms libertarian freedom, it's because God has created us. He's made us in his image as immaterial thinking things who can be reasonable and rational and logical, who, who have intentional states of consciousness. We can think of and about the laws of logic and of and about competing uh, hypotheses or competing um, possibilities and things like that. We can think of and about these things by God's grace. This seems to be supernatural, and we are uh, not just immaterial thinking things, but immaterial rational thinking things. So I just don't see it. It's not random and it's not determined. You are an immaterial thinking thing in God's image who has the uh, opportunities to be rational and to be reasonable or not. But on naturalism or any uh, or exhaustive divine determinism, I think luck is uh, problematic on those views, but not on the Christian libertarian view. Mm. Yeah, that were my, uh, you just gave me a good idea for that article I was talking to you about off uh, on the phone yesterday. Oh, yeah. Um, that kind of I'm not going to oh, cool. speak on it here. Uh, Stay tuned, everyone. <laughs> there you um, go. <laughs> but uh, that just triggered, that connected something in my brain. So cool. Um, so they move on and they go to their next question. Arguments for free will or against determinism often center around moral responsibility. And I've always been puzzled as to why similar free will arguments centering around rationality have so rarely been discussed. Yeah. Maybe I'll just flag. I don't. I don't know what arguments uh, for free will um, our listener has in mind. But just because someone was arguing for free will wouldn't necessarily mean they were arguing against determinism, unless they're sort of already building incompatibilism into their view. Yes, it doesn't necessarily follow that one arguing for free will also argues against determinism. But I do. I argue against exhaustive determinism here, and I, and I don't merely assume. I offer arguments against exhaustive determinism and for not merely free will, but for libertarian freedom. I'm not presupposing these things. I'm not assuming these things. I am deductively concluding these things. So, mm. so yeah, there you go. There is a lot of work on free will and rationality. Um, that hasn't really come up much in the podcast, but the, there it is there. But it's moral responsibility is much more central because – as I mentioned earlier, a lot of people are just using the term free will to denote the control required for moral responsibility. So it's sort of a necessary condition on moral responsibility. 
Right, right. And I've argued that it's a mistake to have such a narrow focus. After all, if determinism destroys the kinds of rationality worth having, then we cannot reliably reach conclusions on this issue. And, and as David Baggett and I have clarified, <clears throat> I'm thinking about it this way, if there's no, if there's no age of accountability, um, or, or say it this way, if there's no age of rationality, then there's no age of accountability when speaking of morality. And a lot of Calvinists mm -hmm. uh, and Christians in gener general, but I hear Calvinists all the time talk about the age of accountability. Well, why is it that once you reach a certain age, now you're accountable? It's because once you reach a certain age, you can start connecting logical dots. You are rational at a certain age. And I'm talking about the specific kind of rationality where you can start connecting logical dots. Um, and so then if you can start doing that, now you're accountable for connecting those dots or not, right? So when we're speaking of morality now, let alone rationality. So indeed, it's, it's the fact that humans are rational animals that makes it possible to be moral animals, right? As opposed to sharks, spiders, or cheetahs, right? We, we can think of and about commands. We can take our thoughts and fleshly desires captive to obey Christ and so on. Animals... Uh, can't do such things. So yeah, this is what separates us from the animals. I look, my an my animal, my dog Rondo is rational in a sense, right? But we're talking about different degrees of rationality. And to just say, oh well, my dog is rational, then you're missing the point of the free thinking argument, uh, where I do argue that um, libertarian freedom is required for rational responsibility. But if you are rationally responsible, then you can be morally responsible. I can yell at my dog when he gets into the trash or pees on the carpet or whatever and yell, but, but is he really morally responsible? I don't think he is. We can train him, right? That, that That's on me. Have I trained him well or not? Um, but I don't think animals uh, can think about commands, take their thoughts captive um, to, uh, to obey reality uh, they, they, they don't take their thoughts captive to obey Christ. That's for sure. Right. <laughs> well, I'm I do thinking... share the God, I do share the gospel with my dog just, just in case. I'll just throw that out there. My, yeah. my wife thinks I'm crazy, but you know, they, they, don't, they, don't, they don't worship. They don't worship. They don't worship our Lord and Savior, so they're not. I mean, I hope my dog does, but you know, we'll see. <laughs> um, but actually, as you're talking, I was thinking about this. So, a lot of it's what seems to be moral responsibility does come down to like your intent in doing something can be praiseworthy or blameworthy, I think. Um, and part of that intent involves having a knowledge of what you believe to be the moral act in that particular instance. So for example, perhaps you've acted immorally, but you might reserve some praiseworthiness because of your intent um, and why you acted the way you did. But in fact, you were just wrong. Well, in order to properly uh deduce like where where your intention should be oriented towards you have to know what's true like what is morally true and what's you know not true in order to know moral truths you have to be rational to to know what they are and so it seems at the very least if we don't have rationality um uh we're not able to deduce what our oughts ought to be mm -hmm. um about uh moral things so yeah i invented that and I don't think anyone would say, I, should, I shouldn't say, I don't think anyone would say. For any of you, there's a philosopher that holds it. Very few people would want to say that freedom is required for rationality in the same way that a lot of people think freedom is required for moral responsibility. Yeah. Well, I do want to say that. And again, I don't just assert it, but I've spilled much ink arguing for it. I, I have run across arguments. Um that do want to say what you said that they don't want to say. <laughs> so, so what you said is true for any of you. Well, there I did is a call philosopher this. Who defends yes. that view. Um, yeah. I, I can't remember where it was published or who was the one who wrote it, but it was a, it was an argument that tried to show that income, that libertarian free will was required for rationality. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I don't remember much of the details of the argument. Just, I'm just throwing out there that there are, there are people who are talking about this. Hmm. I, who could that be? 
I don't know, probably don't some know. wacko on YouTube. <laughs> probably has a YouTube channel and right. some loser that's podcasting with him. <laughs> but anyways, man, when I heard that, because you sent me this to, to listen mm-hmm. to, I was just like, once I got to this part, I was like, oh, I see why Tim wants to talk about this. <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, I, I knew they were talking about me uh, at that point. I, I mean, uh, to Taylor's credit, um, he was aware of my work. He told me on uh, solving the problem of evil and things like that. So I don't know if he is aware of the free thinking argument and things like mm-hmm. that. I'd be surprised if he hadn't seen it. Matt he only, a, to have seen it. only a few Google searches away. That's right. No. That's right. No, um, at this point, I mean, no. uh, people should be aware of this if you're in the field, but yeah, but not surely not. I mean, of course that doesn't mean that everybody will be, but uh, right. Um, yeah. I'm sure you will be now. Well, so. and like they said, I mean, you're not the only one that makes this case. No, um, I stand on the shoulders of giants. Yeah. So, so very similar things. So. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so they go on and say, maybe we should say a lot of people, Dirk Parabooms, one of these, Greg Caruso following him says the same sort of thing. When they talk about basic dessert, they have in mind being uh, deserving of praise or blame just in virtue of knowingly doing what you did. So in the case Mm of, you know, blame or punishment, if it's basically deserved, it's because you knowingly did wrong and not because blaming you is going to have some good effect or anything else. There's nothing more basic than just that you knowingly did wrong. Yeah. That actually goes back to the point I was making about you kind of need the rationality to know whether what you're doing is right or wrong. If you're mm-hmm. unable to know if what you're doing is right or wrong, then it's tough to see. You could be, I suppose, morally blameworthy for the act itself, but it would be, I guess, less blameworthy if you didn't know what you were doing was wrong. Right. Yeah, I think that's okay. And I think you so, see that quite yeah. often if somebody gets in trouble, they're like, I didn't know. Right. Well, so for example, <laughs> so for example, if you uh, let's say take a, I don't know, I don't know, something takes, if I took something from your house, but like, I thought it was mine, perhaps Mm. I would be morally blameworthy for the act of taking something that wasn't mine, but it wouldn't be to the same extent if I knew it wasn't mine and I took it, um, then it would be, I think I'd be rightfully more blamed, um, in that case. Yeah. If we had the same kind of car and you got in my car because they're basically identical and drove off and the police pulled you over and then you realized it was my car and they arrested you for stealing it. Mm-hmm. You'd have a pretty good excuse. Right. right? Well, you know. Again, that wouldn't, I would still have broken the law. Even yeah. though I was, it was unintentional. Yeah. And odds are you might get off, especially yeah. since you left your car for me. That's true. <laughs> I'll trade you. Uh, yeah. Right. Well, anyway, just talking about the knowings of what's right and wrong. I, I think that view doesn't, I mean, there's something to that definitely, but I don't think it addresses the, the, the whole problem or the big picture. Um, at least if determinism exhaustively describes all things about humanity, because well, I mean, th- think about it this way. If, if God causally determines all things about each human, then a human is causally determined by God to know, say uh, cheating on his wife is evil, right? So they they would know that, but they'd also be causally determined by God to cheat on their, his wife anyway, right? If he does cheat on his wife. And I know Christians who have cheated on their wives and they knew it was wrong, right? So now uh, if we ascribe source of libertarian freedom to the agent and God is then the counterfactual intervener and God would stop the man uh, from cheating on his wife, if he knowingly knew it was wrong and decided to do it anyway. But then God st- uh, stops the adulterous act from occurring. It doesn't seem like the man uh, should be praised for not committing adultery because he wanted to do it. Uh, he tried to do it, but God stopped it, right? God should be praised, right? Um, but but don't praise the, the man uh, or, or think about it on the other side of the coin. I mean, if the man knew it was wrong to commit adultery, and freely decided not to give in to temptation, right? He's in he's in that room with the woman. He's right there, and he takes his thoughts captive. He takes his flesh, fleshly desires captive. And he's like, no, I'm not going to do this. Uh, and he turns around, and he walks out of the room. But then 
God causally determines the man to turn back around and cheat on his wife anyway, well, then it seems like the man should not be blamed for this, right? Uh, he took his thoughts captive. He did the right thing and, and did like did like Joseph and, and ran, right? Mm -hmm. But then God turned him around and made him cheat on his wife anyway. Well, should, should the man be blamed? No, the man should be praised, right? But God here in this scenario would be the author of evil. And I contend that God would never do such a thing. But Calvinists who affirm Ed, exhaustive divine determinism, have to say that ultimately God causally determines uh, these evil things to happen. I mean, at least mm -hmm. if you're going to affirm Ed, the E of Ed. Anyway, my point is that we need to go deeper when discussing determinism and uh, knowingly doing wrong, um, because I think there's a bigger picture we need to address. Yeah. And I think, um, as we showed earlier, if you're a Calvinist, you don't need to affirm Ed. Um, That's right. You, uh, you are well within your rights to affirm Tulip and not Ed. So mm -hmm. Yeah. Follow Greg Kokel's lead. Yeah. Um, so they go on to their next question. It seems that asking the question whether or not sufficiently advanced AI could, in principle, have free will would really help clarify the meaning of free will employed in various positions. For example, uh, it seems that the garden variety compatibilist might accept that AI could, in principle, have free will, whereas substance dualists probably would not. Does this way of framing things come up in discussions around free will? Yeah, you know... Uh... Uh, Angus Minouge, uh, the former president of the EPS, the Evangelical Philosophical Society, and, uh, and a brilliant philosopher, has argued that uh, AI, artificial intelligence, is metaphysically impossible for several reasons. Uh, although ignorant humans uh, who don't know better might be fooled. Now, one of these reasons is a lack of libertarian freedom. Uh, for a purely physical machine. And, and Angus uh, Manuj and I, we actually, uh, I sat in on a lecture of his and had the opportunity to then discuss this issue with him in person. So yeah, am amazing conversation. Yeah. So like as a computer science guy myself, that was what I did in my bachelor's. Uh, I would definitely agree with this. Um, I mean, I find that most people in these conversations have no idea what they're talking about when they talk about AI. Even the framing of and I, I don't mean to disparage the questioner, but like the idea of a sufficiently advanced AI, mm -hmm. that isn't that concept isn't sufficient to um, frame the discussion because it's important. Like, how is it advanced? Because mm -hmm. the way in which these are built, maybe this would be a good podcast topic, anyways. Um, just some of these algorithms, it, there's not. It's not as though some of the problems that. AI can't solve it aren't because of tech, like just our limitations. They're just logical ones that yeah. human, that machines cannot solve. Um, there's a class of unsolvable problems uh, within computer science um, by, by algorithm. And so no matter what, there are going to be things that AIs can't do. And so there's most people, when you say that are kind of caught off guard because they think that AI is just like a, I don't know, a dumber version of human reasoning, whereas their reasoning right. doesn't seem to be at all similar. An AI reasoning is not at all similar, if you can even call it reasoning, to the way a human mm. would be. So the point is, I haven't read like a lot of philosophers on this. It would not shock me if most of them don't understand AI, really. Um, but yeah, I would say educate yourself. Mm -hmm. No, I think this is, uh, it's cool that you've got... Uh, education and computer science and now are pursuing graduate degrees in philosophy. I think you're going to mm -hmm. be able to uh, do some good work here in this field. But, you know, uh, when I listened to uh, Professor Manoj discuss this, if memory serves, I think he offered four reasons. Uh, he offered four metaphysical cases um, as to why um, AI is metaphysically impossible. Um, and then during the Q and a from the crowd, I raised my hand and I said, do you think there's also, uh, the problem with libertarian freedom that uh, a purely physical machine doesn't seem to be the type of thing, no matter how advanced could possess libertarian freedom. 
not always being causally determined by the laws and events of nature or something like that. And, and he says, yes, indeed. That was one of his points. He just didn't share it that night. <laughs> and he completely agreed with me. Um, so that led to the two of us having a longer conversation that night and also had some uh, few email exchanges. But I um, mean, I quote him in my book as well. I don't think not on this particular uh, matter, but you know, others have made similar cases. Think, think about John Searle. I mean, he's the guy that came up with the, you know, he's an atheist philosopher and he has provided the famous uh, Chinese room thought experiment that shows not only that a, a computer or a, a ro or robot, um, that they don't possess intentional states of consciousness uh, for one thing, but that it's also simply causally determined by programming of the past and, uh, and natural laws. Now it's been a while, I've actually wrote on this. Um, this is one of those older blog articles. So I'd want to reserve the right to go back and maybe tweak a few things here and there. Um, but I wrote one called Free Thinking in a, in a Chinese Room. And so I'd maybe point people to that. Uh, another one I wrote is called Robots and Rationality. Again, that was older. Um, and I think I would probably go in and tweak a few things. But my same overall uh, thoughts would be, uh, would be the same. I might, uh, be a bit more precise in a few things, but, uh, let me just say this. It's vital for me to make something clear. There's no strict logical contradiction with the proposition. Uh, the robot possesses libertarian freedom, right? Just saying that, um, it, you know, at face value, there's no logical contradiction there. It's not like saying, uh, the triangle has four corners or the triangle has four angles or something like that. So, um, but, but, but when enough of the facts are known, it seems that it's metaphysically impossible or logically impossible in a broad sense for a robot to possess libertarian freedom. At the least, it's uh, maybe I'll just say it's probably impossible. For a robot to possess libertarian freedom. Now, I mean, I, I suppose an, om, an omnipotent God has the power to create a metallic robot and suffuse an immaterial soul in his image and likeness into the droid. I guess that's possible. But if you don't think God does that type of thing, then we would say that robots are not free and responsible in a desert sense. And surely it doesn't seem like humans have the ability to create robots and imbue an immaterial soul in the image of God <laughs> into the metallic robot. And, but since I argue that libertarian freedom is necessary for dessert responsibility, then it follows that we should not hold robots, even advanced robots responsible for their thoughts or actions. You know, if they have thoughts or all, I don't think they do. I don't think they possess, I don't think it's even metaphysically possible for a robot to possess intentional states of consciousness. But even if you were to grant that, uh, it'd still be causally determined, right? Programmers, should be held responsible for the actions of their robots. Now, for the sake of argument and, and the fun of conversation, let's suppose that all things about an advanced robot are not causally determined, right? Just for fun, I'll, I'll grant it. Uh, this would then lead to instances where the droid could make uh, a choice that is not causally determined by its programming. Well, if this is the case, and the droid is free to choose, then my question is this, what exactly is the choosing part of the droid, right? What is that thing? What is doing the choosing? If not all things about the droid are causally determined by something or someone else, maybe it's free from, uh, there's something about quantum indeterminacy factored in that, that uh, makes it not causally determined, then okay, now what part of the droid are we talking about? If it's something, that is also causally determined by something else like physics and chemistry, then it doesn't seem like the, the kind of freedom worth wanting has really been rescued for the robot. So I need to think mm -hmm. about this more. I have thought about this actually quite a bit a few years ago. Um, I've seen some attempts to do that, but it just seemed to me like it just kicked the can down the road and it appealed to a part of the robot that would still be causally determined by physics and chemistry. Mm. Uh, so I don't know. We'll see. I need, I'll do some more work on that. Yeah. I think for most people, the answer is, yeah, we could in principle accept that AI 
um, could have free will. I mean, the only reason to think not would have to be that you think there's something about us that is maybe uh, non-physical, maybe the that we have an immaterial soul. Our listener referred to substance dualists. If you think there's this immaterial substance, your your soul or mind that's distinct from your body, and you think that having that soul is necessary for free will, well, then assuming that we can't imbue artificial intelligences with immaterial souls, I, no matter what we do to the you know physical stuff, it looks like we couldn't bestow free will on the AI. Man, I, I love this conversation. And Taylor's making some great points here. Now, I, I should note that the free thinking argument against naturalism uh, provides us with a reason, not merely an assumption, but a reason to think that an immaterial aspect of humanity is necessary for libertarian freedom and rational responsibility, which then ultimately provides the foundation for moral responsibility. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, like, Taylor goes and brings up, you know, data from star trek you know i i love using science fiction mm -hmm. to introduce philosophy and to you know have helpful thought experiments in the background but you know classic robot stories like from isaac asimov's bicentennial man or um the case of the android and star trek the next generation uh, data he's been around the other star trek too but um the, there these works of science fiction explore this very topic um yeah are, are these um, artificial intelligences, these robots, androids, are they making decisions freely? Are they persons in the same way that you and I are persons? Um, and I think a lot of people, if, you know, there might be disagreement about how sophisticated the AI would have to be to meet this threshold for having free will. But I think a lot of people would say it's in principle possible. And that doesn't require compatibilism so long as the, um, you know, programming for the AI could involve indeterminacy. It seems like you could build uh, an artificial intelligence that has free will, just like we are built <laughs> to have free will if you're libertarian. Yeah, again, um, it seems to me that if we are built to have libertarian freedom and desert responsibility, then there are at least three essential ingredients we need for this to happen. Uh, maybe more, but at least three. Uh, so number one, uh, we must possess intentional states of consciousness with an ability to think of and about things like the laws of logic and other abstract concepts or ideas. Uh, so you, uh, bottom line, you got to have intentionality here. You, you, you have to possess intentional states of consciousness. Uh, number two, uh, the thinking thing that chooses needs to be free in a libertarian sense. That is that it can't be causally determined by something or someone else. Right. So the thinking thing that chooses has to be free in a libertarian sense. And number three, it cannot be random. Right. So we need to be the kind of things uh, that are created to uh, to possess uh, powers of reflective self-control, as uh, Christopher Evan Franklin would say. Um, uh, we have to <clears throat> have the uh, the powers of reflective self-control with the power and opportunity uh, to exercise an ability to take. Uh, popping thoughts captive, uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 5, or not, Colossians 2, 8. So anyway, I believe this is a, a supernatural ability given to us by God in his grace. And I think at least uh, that you can say that, that it's the best explanation of all the data. When you consider everything, I think this is the best explanation of all the data. And I think this is what distinguishes us from mere passive cogs at the mercy of external forces and makes it possible to genuinely be rational and responsible free thinkers because we were created that way by God as image bearers. So mm. I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, I think that kind of goes back to what we were talking about in the first episode, like the miraculous occurrences that right. happen yeah. when we make free choices. Think about yeah. the stories um, that involve really advanced robots and when they do good things and when they do bad things, I initially want to react in the same way that I would react to a, a, a normal human being with, yeah. you know, feelings of praise and blame or like say that they, you know, oh, they deserved what they got or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can agree with Matt about his initial intuitions. I mean, after all, I grew up cheering for C-3PO and R2-D2 and I still do. But after all of the facts are known, 
I no longer share this intuition when I watch sci-fi movies about droids or robots. Uh, indeed, um, you know, K2SO in the Star Wars uh, story Rogue One uh, makes this clear. And so does season one of the, of the Mandalorian. In fact, if people want to read about this in depth, in my rejoinder to Guillaume Bignon, the Calvinist, exhaustive, divine determinist um, philosopher, uh, it's 50 pages worth if you'd like to read it, but I spend a, two or three pages talking about this. Um, and I discuss uh, the droid K2SO in depth, and then I offer a long footnote about the Mandalorian and the IG bounty hunter slash assassin droid who was programmed to kill baby Yoda and who then became the babysitter slash nanny droid slash bodyguard who would ultimately sacrifice its metallic parts to save the life of baby Yoda and the Ugnaught uh, to all the, uh, you know, nerds out there, <laughs> the Ugnaught uh, character in the Mandalorian makes it clear that the programmers uh, with freedom, uh, seemingly with libertarian freedom are responsible for the programmed or reprogrammed causally determined droids who don't possess libertarian freedom. So, yeah, I discuss this a lot in that rejoinder if people want to find that on the Free Thinking Ministries website, freethinkingministries.com. Well, I mean, I even think about, you know, the Terminator movies where right. Arnold is, he, at one point, you know, he comes back and is trying to, spoiler alert, they're from the 80s. You should probably have watched them by now. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, in the first one, he comes back, he's trying to kill Sarah Connor. Um, but then the second one, he comes back in time and is protecting That's Sarah right. Connor because he's been reprogrammed. There you go. Um, and, you know, when you think about it that way, it's like, OK. You have I mean, just because the way the movie kind of builds it up, you do have this like, oh, why is he doing this? Like, mm -hmm. you're, but, you know, you reflect on it and you're like, oh, no, it's actually um, I suppose they would say that AI has, you know, come out of control or whatever but you know if ai does have those kinds of capabilities it's like them that are to blame not this you know yeah. robot that's been programmed but mm -hmm. exactly. anyways that's where my brain goes yeah i will say the the sticking point for me and this is probably true of certain other philosophers too is the question of consciousness mm -hmm. and artificial intelligence because there <laughs> there's a still this very hard problem it's called the hard problem of consciousness <laughs> excellent like, name could, yeah that's right thanks david chalmers uh, there's a big puzzle about how consciousness could arise from physical systems. And yeah, there's this question of like how we would know whether an artificial intelligence is conscious. And while there are some people who don't think that there's like a, I don't know, tight connection between free will and consciousness, I think the common view is that if you're not conscious, you don't have the control required for responsibility. Uh, amen to that. Uh, Taylor and I are completely on the same page there. Um, after all, if one cannot think of and about the laws of logic and competing hypotheses or uh, alternative possibilities and uh, alternative beliefs, uh, then one cannot choose the best explanation or the best belief. So you have mm -hmm. to be able, if you don't have consciousness, if you, if you don't have intentional states of consciousness, uh, if you can't think of and about competing hypotheses, you cannot freely choose the mm -hmm. best hypothesis, yeah. <laughs> you know, so yeah, uh, he's exactly right. You got to have uh, intentionality or, or intentional states of consciousness here. Oh yeah. All right, Tim, you want to wrap it up there and then next time we can continue on and talk about their next question. Yeah. I think the next question is going to be about love is libertarian freedom or, or I'm sorry. Yeah. Is libertarian freedom required for true love or the best kind of love? So you don't want to miss that. All right. Talk to you guys then. Peace.